Yes, we thank God for giving us uh, another opportunity today to study his word. And as I always say, it's a, a privilege to study the word of God. I usually think about um, the believers of the Old Testament who never had Bibles in their homes. They never had Bibles in their, in their phones. And uh, they used to go to the synagogues or to the temple um, once a week to listen to the word being read. And yet they were so committed to the word of God. And us today, we are so blessed that the word of God is everywhere on YouTube or here on Facebook, in your churches and everywhere. And I think it's good to maximize this moment that God has given us uh, to study uh, his word. So I want to uh, share my screen uh, with us. Uh, like uh, we do always. And uh, today we are going to study from the book of Luke, as I said, chapter seven, uh, verse one to 10, about the miracle of the healing of the centurion's uh, servant. And uh, the main uh, theme really today is about faith. What is really faith? And uh, I hope that God is going to help us even as we study today. But before we move on to the study of today, I just want us to do a quick review of what we looked at last week, Friday. And it was about um, uh, the Sabbath, about Jesus healing on the Sabbath. And we saw that there is this man that Jesus healed in a synagogue and it was in a Sabbath. And there were teachers of the law as always who were following up and they had an issue about Jesus healing on the Sabbath. And we took time to look at the meaning of the Sabbath, especially from the Old Testament and the New Testament. And then we concluded by saying, how, what, what is the relevance of the Sabbath to us today? And I think the main uh, thing that we picked from last week is that Sabbath is a gift to us that God has given us, that we need to accept. Sabbath is not a day, but Sabbath is a principle of spiritual rest that was started by God himself from the book of Genesis during creation, that on the seventh day, he rested. He took time to reflect and look at everything that he had created. And he said, wow, it was wonderful. It was excellent. And then we say that we need to work six days but we need to take off one day and devote it to the focus on God. Look into our lives and do things that deepen our relationship uh, with God. So Sabbath, as I said last week, is not about uh, going to church. It is not about, you know, having a worship service, but Sabbath is more than that. You can use your Sabbath part of it to go to church, to have a worship service, to do something. But Sabbath should be a, a place where you rest, where you relax in the presence of God and you reflect on what God has done into your life. And also you can use that time to meet the needs uh, of, of, of humanity. And now I want us to move to the study of today and uh, just hopefully that you, for those who attended the Bible study last week, you applied what we learned because we are not just here to, to broadcast things on uh, Zoom or on Facebook, but we are here on a serious mission to open the Bible and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us. And it will make sense if we put into practice what the Holy Spirit uh, speaks unto us. It's not useful just to accumulate head knowledge from attending these Bible studies, but to allow that knowledge to come down from the head to the heart and let the heart pump that knowledge to the every part of our lives. And that is what we call application so that this word can be mixed with faith and it can be useful uh, unto us. So I hope that you took time to reflect about Sabbath, to take a stake of your life and look at how you run the whole week and ask yourself, do you take a day off out of the seven days to reflect on God? to deepen your relationship uh, with God. And today we are looking at the miracle 
where Jesus healed the servant of the centurion from the book of Luke uh, chapter seven. I want to start with the context of that miracle. And it was at Capernaum. And this is the Northern part of Israel. And actually it happened immediately after the sermon on the Mount. Most of us have read about the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the pure at heart and all that that Jesus was teaching. So actually this healing took exactly after, because if you look at Luke chapter six, verse 46, which is the last verses of uh, before chapter seven, he says that when he had completed all his discourse, the discourse here meaning the Sermon on the mountain, uh, and then this, this is when this happened. And he finished actually his discourse with these words where he was challenging the people who are listening to him on the Sermon on the Mountain about not just calling him Lord, Lord, but submitting to his Lordship. He told them, why do you call me Lord? And then you do not do what I say. And I think that is really very important as we consider the miracle uh, of, of, of today. And actually, if you go through all the gospels, you realize that it's only twice in the gospels does Jesus commend a person for having great faith. And it so happens that these two people are actually Gentiles and not even Jewish people. And one of them happens to be a woman and another one happens to be a man. The woman is the Canaanite woman in Matthew chapter 15. And I think this is a very interesting uh, miracle uh, God giving us opportunity will come to it. This is one miracle where Jesus was reluctant to heal the daughter of a woman who came and the woman kept on begging. And lastly, Jesus commended her for her faith. And uh, we are going to look into that and see why if the woman came to Jesus asking him for healing of her daughter, why was Jesus not willing in the beginning to heal this daughter. And that persistence of this woman goes in record. It actually touched Jesus and they called it great faith. And the second uh, recommendation of a, a person of a great faith is our study today, Luke chapter seven. And in verse nine, we find Jesus recommending this commander of the army of the Romans in Israel because of his great faith. And uh, the first thing that I want us to look, because I'll be touching on the different verses, even as we go through. Uh, so we are going to learn about uh, three things about faith. The first one is that faith is an exalted view of Jesus Christ. And the second one is that faith is a low view of ourselves. And the third one is faith is a view of caring for others. Let's start with the first one. In chapter, in verse seven, Jesus, the Bible records and says, just say the word and my servant will be healed. These were the words of this commander of the army. He didn't consider himself so worthy that Jesus will come to his house. And he just said that if you just say a word, it is enough and my servant to be healed. And this is after he had told Jesus that he had about a hundred soldiers under him. And when he commanded them, he told one, go and do this, he will go and do it. When he says someone stop doing this, those who have been in the army uh, know this. When the commander gives a command, you don't question you do what the commander says. And this guy comes to Jesus and tells him, that is who I am. And he was of the ruling class, because remember this time the Jewish people were under the, 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 the rulership of the Romans or the Italians of today. And this guy, were, this guy was in this city to, to enforce the rule of Rome. And everybody here, including the religious leader, submitted to this commander because he was like the governor of the city. And Jesus himself, of course, he had been in Capernaum. And by there, I discovered that Jesus, out of his three and a half years of ministry, he actually spent 18 months 
which is one and a half years, almost a half, actually in this province of Kapenam. So the reality is that he knew very well this commander. There's no way he could not know the governor within the city. And then when this guy, his servant was sick, but he didn't consider himself worthy even to go by himself to go and ask Jesus to come. So he sent some of the leaders of the Jewish uh, uh, religious community to go and beg Jesus on his behalf to come and heal his servant. But then when he was on the way, going to heal this servant, then this commander sent uh, some of his friends to go and tell Jesus that please don't come, just say a word and my servant will be healed. And Jesus recommends him for his faith. Why? Because he had faith that Jesus was able not only to come personally and heal, but just a word from Jesus was able to heal his servant. And when you look at how this guy expressed his faith, it's really a challenge to us. Is God an alternative when it comes to the way we relate to him? Or is God the only choice? Many times we make God an alternative. We come to God when we have tried all things. Maybe it's a matter of sickness. Someone has tried everything possible around. And when they feel that now they are not getting the healing or the, 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 the good health that they need, then they say, can we try God? Can we try Jesus? But this guy is teaching us that faith is not where we put God as an alternative. Faith is where God is the only choice. Is where we exalt God to a level like without him, all the alternatives that we have actually amount to nothing. This is exactly what the psalmist was saying, that I lift my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. We know that the word mountains and the symbol mountains in the Bible, you know, stands for sources of help. People that you can depend on, your job, the, 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 the government system, you know, things that you can look up to, you know, your backup when you have issues. But the psalmist is saying that I lift my eyes beyond the mountains because my help comes beyond the mountains. Yes, I have the mountains in my life and I'm grateful for those people in my life, for those opportunities in my life, for those provisions in my life. But the reality is, my source is not those people or those things that I look up to. The real source is actually God. And this is what we call faith, where we exalt God above our jobs. We exalt God above our families. We exalt God above our nations. We exalt God above our savings. We exalt God above our abilities, above our networks. That is real faith. But when we come to God as the last option, that is not really faith. And that is why this guy is saying, just say a word. I don't need even to see a miracle to believe you, God. I don't need you to put your hand on me so that I can believe that I can get healing. I don't need a symbol, just say a word. It's a very high level of faith. It shows how much he believed in Jesus. And the second thing that we can learn about faith from this commander is that faith is a low view of self. And these two are connected. In verse seven, he tells Jesus, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. Remember, this is the guy who had enough to boast. He could boast about his great faith because he had faith. He could boast because he was a good man who was loved by the people that he was colonizing. Actually, if you read that text, the Bible says that the Jewish people really loved him. He was a commander 
he was, you know, the symbol of colonialism in the city, but he was a good man. He was generous. He had actually built a synagogue for them. And he was a compassionate man because he is standing in the gap for his servant and actually who was a slave. At this time, uh, slaves were really people who were not regarded so much, but he cared and he was so compassionate. And maybe he could come to God and say, oh, Jesus, you see, I'm a good man. I have, I give money. I've even built a whole church. You know, synagogues were like the building, the church buildings that we have today. You know, I am a good person. I am here representing, you know, the oppressive government, but I am very kind and everybody loves me around. And even now you can see, I really believe that you are able to heal me and you are able to heal my servant. He could have boasted of all these things, but that is not faith. Faith is when we humble ourselves. When we go to a position and say, we do not deserve God's blessings because of our prayers, because of our giving, because we serve God. And for those who have followed me on these Bible studies, I've always repeated this thing. You can never hold God at ransom. You cannot tell God that because I pray, I expect you to do this. Because I have faith, I expect you to heal me. Because I give my tithes and my offering, I expect you to provide for me, to protect for me, and I will suffer no loss because I serve you. I am your servant. That is not faith. It's actually pride. Faith is a place where even if you do all these things, even when you have prayed and fasted for 40 days, even when you have given everything, you still come to God and say, I am not worthy. God, if you choose to do it, glory to your name. Let your will be done and not my will. This is faith. Many times, People don't see this aspect of faith, the humility part of it. They think that faith is having a strong belief that God will do what you want or what you're praying or what you're trusting him for. But many times God knows better than we do. And that is why all our prayers should always end. Let your will be done and not mine. This is a mark of faith. To approach God based on what he has done and not what we have done is a mark of faith and humility. We approach God in his terms, not on our terms. We don't come to God and tell him how good we have been so we deserve something from him. But we come to God and tell him because of what Christ has done for us, we are approaching his throne of grace that we may obtain mercy in time of need. Look at this. We are approaching his throne of grace. What is grace? Grace is unmerited favor. Something that you get that you don't deserve. It doesn't matter who you are and who I am, when we approach God, it's all by grace. And when we come to this throne of grace, we are asking our needs to be met according to the mercies of God. So it's by the mercy of God that he provides for us. We cannot come and pride ourselves and say because we work hard, because we are talented, because we are knowledgeable, because we have network, because we have prayed, because we have fasted, because we have given, all those are works. We don't approach God based on what we have done, but we approach him based on what he has done. And then secondly, we approach God on his terms, not on our terms. We may have our desires. We may have what we want the Lord to do for us, but faith, demands that when we bring all our needs and our desires before God, we submit them to him and tell him, Lord, this is my desire, but let your will be done. And that is faith. The third aspect of faith 
is that faith is a caring view of others. This commander was a high ranking official in the Roman government. And he had servants. And I've told you that in those days, those who were slaves, those who are not people that will, not, will even stand before the commander. But when one of them was sick, he took compassion. He could have got a new servants and say, ah, if you want to die, because actually the Bible says that he was sick and he was ready to die, about to die. But because of his compassion, he said, I will go an extra mile to look for help for my servant. He took a step to care for somebody who was weak, somebody who was not even worthy his care according to his status in society. Faith is best demonstrated on how we treat others, especially the weak and those who are despised in society. James tells us in, chapter, in the book of James chapter two verse 14, what what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith, but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is actually dead. So true faith is actually demonstrated when not only we focus on ourselves, but when we lift our eyes to other people. How, if we are men and women of faith, this is a test of faith. How much do you trust God for other people's needs? How much time do you take to pray for other people's needs? How much inconvenience are you willing to, you know, to, to, to forego so that other people's needs can be met? And especially people outside your circle of respect. Because you know, there's people who say, oh, these are my loved ones. Oh, this one, I can fast for them. I can pray for them. I can do anything to see them healed. But what about those in the streets, those who are despised, those who are weak, those who are suffering, those who are far away that you just see on the news, that they are suffering in another part of the world? How much are you willing to trust God for their needs to be met? This is a measure of faith. So faith is not only when it works to meet our needs, but faith is demonstrated when it is given outside. And I will say that faith is actually an attitude because many times we think that faith is a feeling that comes when I am in need and I'm trusting God for something. And then now I will believe strongly. I'll start praying. I'll start doing something to demonstrate my faith. That can be an aspect of it. Of it. But faith is actually a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle of submitting to God, not only in big things, but in small things. I said in two, three weeks ago that if you cannot trust God to heal you with a common cold, then you have no business trusting him to heal you with cancer. Because when it's common cold, you think like, oh, I can just go and pick some medicine and just I'll be okay. I don't need to pray about it. God will, this one, my body will deal with it. But when it comes to cancer, then you're like, no, I need prayers now. We need to fast. We need to give. We need to do something about faith. Actually, faith is a lifestyle. And those say that common cold cannot kill. You know, when this corona came, <laughs> if you look at all the symptoms of corona, it's just like a common cold. You know, that's what they say today. If you feel like, you know, <laughs> you know, you flu like symptoms, then you need to take a test. I think this thing is to remind us that faith is trusting God in everything. What you call small, what you call big, should be a lifestyle. When you wake up in the morning, how do you demonstrate your faith? 
It's by humbling yourself and saying, God, thank you for a new day. Thank you for protecting me during the night. And I said, face this new day. God, guide me. Be with me. As I go to my job, give me favor. Bless the works of my hands. You pray for your children. You pray for the, all your household. It is a lifestyle. It's a demonstration of faith that we need to show it to God every day. Faith is not an act. Faith is a lifestyle that we live every day. And as I come to a, a conclusion, I actually want to ask this question. If you read this text in Luke chapter seven, you'll be surprised where the healing is. Actually, this is Bible study and I will really encourage you to go back and read you'll be surprised that the emphasis is not on the miracle because we don't even know how the miracle happened. <laughs> we just see conversations between the religious leaders who were sent to Jesus to call him to come and heal the servant. And when they were on the way, before they arrived at the home, they meet some people who were sent by the commander to tell Jesus, no, you're not, I'm not worthy that you can come to my house. And then Jesus goes on to speak to the crowd that was around him and tell him, in the whole of Israel, I have never seen a faith like this. And then towards the last verse, verse 10, the Bible just says that when those friends went back home, they found that the servant was healed. Actually, we are never even told how Jesus healed. The emphasis is not about the gymnastics of the healing. And I think this is an important point I want to note about how Jesus did miracles. Because remember, the reason why we are studying the miracles of Jesus partly is to see how does godly miracle happen? Does God do miracles today? And if miracles are happening today, how can I know that these are miracles from God or these ones are not from God? What is the right attitude towards miracles? These are some of the objectives why we go through these miracles. And I think as we go through one and uh, uh, each and every miracle that we're going, there's something that we learn. And I think something we learn about miracles, how Jesus did miracles today, is that the emphasis was on the word. The emphasis was on Jesus, the truth about Jesus. Jesus was revealing to the crowd about the faith of this commander, how he believed in him to heal. And Jesus never focused on miracles. And that is why the right attitude towards miracles is not emphasis and focus on miracles, but an emphasis and a focus on the word of God. If you are taking more time chasing miracles, praying for miracles, looking for miracles, then that is an healthy attitude towards miracles. And actually even Jesus said, all these things will follow you. We don't follow miracles, but we follow Christ, who is the word from John chapter one. You know, the word was with God and the word was made flesh. Christ is the word. And we read our Bible, we study our Bible, we, we equip ourselves with the word of God. Our faith comes by hearing the word of God and the miracles follow. So when you go to places and you find that people are focusing so much on miracles, they don't focus on the word. They are focusing more on testimonies of what God is doing. They spend a half of their time or even three quarters of their time talking about the acts of God and what they want God to do for them and very little time on study of the word of God, reading the Bible, studying the Bible. Then that is an unbalanced view. I'm not saying that it's totally wrong. We should expect God to do miracles. We believe in miracles. We should pray for miracles. We should look up to God to do miracles. And there is need for God to do miracles in our lives. But what I'm saying is that we should not be followers of miracles, but we should follow the word of God more. We should be grounded more on the word of God. How do you know a healthy church, a healthy preacher, someone who focuses more 
on the word, not on miracles. And that is why actually you see here that Jesus focuses on lifting up faith and using the example of this commander. And the miracle, if you look at the text very well, it's like, it's a subtopic. Although the heading is about the healing of, of this uh, servant, but in the text itself, it's actually very minimal because Christ wants us to focus uh, on him. And so as I conclude today, my challenge will be to us today, how much do we believe in Jesus? What is our level of faith? How do we practice our faith? How do we approach God in our faith? Do we approach God on what we do? Do we believe that God will bless us based on how much we do or how much we give? Or do we come to God believing that irrespective of who we are, what we do or what we don't do, God is a gracious God and he will meet our needs. He will heal our sicknesses. He will save our loved ones. He will protect us when we are in danger. He will provide for us when we are going through difficult times. And this should be our lifestyle of faith. That is true faith. And lastly, faith is humble. Faith humbles before God. Faith is where you come to God and say, Lord, I am willing to submit to what you want me to do. Yes, this is what I want. This is what I need, but I submit to you. And I want to put the, this across to you that this is what most people find difficult to, to get. They come and they ask, God, I'm trusting you for healing. Why are you not healing me? And some people, when God does not come through for them, God does not do what they wanted, them, God, they wanted God to do for them, they get offended at God. They say, God, I had faith. I believe that you will heal my son. You will heal my daughter. You will give me this job. Now you have disappointed me. I don't even know whether you love me. This goes back to what I'm saying. When you say you believed, you had faith, you lacked an element of faith because one element of faith is humility. When you come to God, you believe he's able to do it, but even when he does not do it, your faith remains strong. This is the faith that the three Hebrew boys had in the book of Daniel. They told, Kibnab, they told this king, and Nebuchadnezzar, who wanted to throw them into the fire, they say, we know our God is able to deliver us from this fire, but we want to make it clear to you, even if it does not deliver us from this fire, we shall not bow down. For me, that is a classic definition of faith. They submitted to the will of God. If God delivered them from the fire like he did, it was a sure of faith. If God chose not to deliver them from the fire, their faith was still intact. They will not be disappointed that God never showed up. So I pray that God will help us that as we trust him, as we approach him in faith, we will have this balanced view and understanding of faith.